So I'm Writing a Novel is the show where you join me, Oliver Brackenbury, on the journey of writing my next novel. From first ideas all the way to publication and promotion. In this one-man reality show, I'll share with you my ever-evolving thoughts and feelings on how I write, being a writer, and everything that entails at each stage of the process. I'll also interview special guests, and when people send them in, I'll answer listener questions. If you're the kind of person who likes to learn how things are made and get to know the people making them, then this is the show for you. I'd like to say a quick thank you to our Patreon supporters who make this show possible. Patrons receive perks like the rarely wielded but very powerful ability to vote in patron-exclusive polls which shape the future of what I do in the Patreon, but also in the podcast. And if you're not a patron already, you can check out all the other perks and exclusive content over at patreon.com slash so I'm writing a novel. You may have noticed that the intro music for this episode was a little different. Well, that's because it was played by the band Glasshammer. They're a prog rock group formed in 1992, featuring multi-instrumentalist Steve Babb, my guest for today. Steve is a big fan of sword and sorcery and has written his own sword and sorcery novel called Scalagrim in the Vales of Pagarna, which he was kind enough to send me a copy of to read. I rather enjoyed it, and the clear intersection between it and the whole way one might write a concept album There's quite a bit of actual songs within the text of the book, with something I'll get into with Steve in just a minute. Meanwhile, music is a very important part of the fan community of Sword and Sorcery, and it tends to be in genres that I have not dabbled in too much, like heavy metal, like prog rock, though I confess I do enjoy some stuff uh, in the latter category. I just kind of forget sometimes that I enjoy it until it comes on the radio and I'm like, oh yeah, I should get more of this. Anyway, point being, this is an aspect of the whole thing that I'm a little ignorant of, and so I thought what a great opportunity after meeting Steve through the Whetstone Tavern Discord, where I get so many guests. <laughs> but yes, after meeting Steve through there and uh, you know, looking at his book and all that stuff, I thought what a great opportunity for me to learn more about that side of things through someone who's directly a part of it. All right, without further ado, let's go on to talk to Steve Babb of the band Glasshammer. Here we are with Steve Babb. Hi, Steve. Hey, how are you doing today? Great, man, great. Uh, so, Steve, I know you've got to get back to the exciting uh, life of a musician. Uh, it's a drum recording this weekend. Yeah. Uh, so uh, let's get into it. Uh, starting at the shallow end of the pool, could you please tell us what your relationship is to Sword and Sorcery? Like, why did you choose to write that instead of, I don't know, hard-boiled uh, detectives or something else? Uh, I mean, I, I have a love for the genre that goes back to my teenage years, which would be, you know, mid seventies to 1980, somewhere in there. I'm 61. So, uh, you know, I, I loved it. Of course, like most people that came to fantasy, it started with Tolkien and, uh, and then branched out from there. And it really wasn't, you know, in those formative years, it, it, I didn't think of them in terms of, of sub genres. It was strictly, it was all fantasy to me and it was all new. Uh, but I remember watching the movie, uh, the animation, the Ralph Bakshi movie, Wizards. Uh, yeah. I, I knew he was going to do something with Lord of the Rings, so I made, uh, uh, I 
made my mom take me to, <laughs> to the theater to see that crazy movie. Uh, and I don't know. I just love that. Excalibur was another big film of the time that, uh, uh, and Conan, of course. Uh, but back to, your, I guess, to the main question, I wanted to do a an album trilogy uh, that would be based on, well, first it started as just a one album thing uh, for Glass Hammer. Man. And uh, it would, it would have, I wanted it to be about a loner, sort of like a high plains drifter kind of character and maybe set to a Western theme. And uh, my songwriting partner and my wife, who I refer to for advice, often were like, no, no Western prog rock albums, please. <laughs> well, what else? And so I'm, with Progressive Rockets, it's, it's a very cliche thing to do stuff about wizards and elves and and i mean people don't do that so much in prog rock but that's what it's sort of known for and i thought well let's just embrace those cliches and let's make it a sword and sorcery character more like conan or elric and i started developing the story and the more i got into the character and the writing um, for the album the more i began to think hey this is this is working for me I like the character. I like the setup to the story. I think I'm going to write this. Uh, it's more than just an album. So it all kind of happened about the same time, I guess, 2019, somewhere. Well, right when the when the lockdown started and everybody did all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah, we all got a lot more time to be creative. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm like, I'll show them. Uh, I'll just write a book. So six, <laughs> six weeks of lockdown, but. Uh, I don't know, seven months of writing and I finally finished a book. Anyway, I hope that's 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 a long answer, I guess. No, it's okay. It's all good stuff. Um, and, and honestly, um, we can sort of go back even earlier to before you started working on uh, that, you know, Scalagram here. Um, I'm wondering what are the origins of you as like a younger person uh, with your writing and your music careers, you know, and how have they like intersected maybe even one's more dominant over the other one for a while and the other one kind of takes over you know how, how generally speaking how have, how have these evolved for you and where did they begin uh i started playing i was a piano player from age nine and they were stuck me in a in our church i became the pianist at age 12 and uh, didn't particularly enjoy that pressure but uh, mm -hmm. you know and it was kind of in the cards early on that i was going to be a musician and of course, by the time I'm in my late teens, uh, rock is big and heavy metal is a big part of my life and wanting to be in a band is a big thing. So uh, the Tolkien influences and the music for me all happened at that crucial moment uh, between 15 and 17 when all of those things are getting wired in your brain. And in my case, they got wired in together. Uh, and I saw music from the very beginning as a way to tell stories and uh so it's never been far from i mean that that's kind of what i've always done with original music is kind of tell sagas concept albums uh things like that my first real i'd say semi-popular band in our area was a band uh, i named wizards after the, the film and we we wore capes. Nice. We wore capes. <laughs> it, was 19, it. it was 1980, and uh, and yeah. the songs were all these dramatic things, like you know, like Iron Maiden kind of stuff, Rush, and Sabbath, and so real dark, and uh, you know, so it was perfect vehicle for me to kind of lyrically tell stories, and I'd say that's that's never changed for me. I I, I try to write a simple song, it ends up getting turned into some epic nonsense, I guess. Very cool. It was Scalagrim your first prose project then, or did you try writing novels and short stories before? I wrote, uh, well, so we had a big concept album, and it's always tied to my music, uh, but we had a big concept album. I um, sort of uh, brainstormed in 2005. Uh, the album was called The Inconsolable Secret, which is a, from a quote by C.S. Lewis. And it was about um, the lady, the Lady of Shallot. Uh, there's famous paintings of her. Uh, it's a kind of a, an obscure Arthurian tale about a, a girl who's trapped in a tower, princess, you know. Uh, and I 
wanted to kind of expand on that and, and add to that story. And it just kind of took off as my own character, which I named uh, Lyra Zell. And I thought, hey, to go with this album, I'm going to write an epic poem, like uh, The Lays of Beleriand, uh, like Tolkien. And so I wrote this massive, I think it's 20,000 words. It all rhymes. <laughs> it's just insane. <laughs> and uh, called The Lay of Lyra Zell. And then uh, I wanted to turn that into a book, an actual novel. And I started it. Um, in I guess the late 2000s, I know, 2008 or nine, and left it at about 30, 40,000 words. Uh, music and life just took over and I couldn't do it. Uh, but then when the Scaligram character came along just mm. a couple of years ago, uh, it hit me how, how that could all go into, together into this mythos that I created for our band. So the stories are tied together. So another long answer, but no, I, I wrote and published, self-published uh, The Lay of Lirazel. I, I guess it actually became a book in 2015, maybe. It took me a while to... Uh, okay, so the writing and prose came a bit later uh, than music was sort of the main thing uh, yeah. for most of your life, it sounds like. That's cool. And I mean, it sounds like you kind of already answered one of my questions, but uh, I'll toss it at you anyways. Um, you know, how would you say you know, your experience writing music influences your prose writing and vice versa. Like, does experience writing lyrics maybe influence the rhythm and meter of your prose? I mean, obviously in the poetry, I would think, uh, but in the in the sort of straight prose, do you find yourself thinking differently about how sentences sound because of how you've had to think about lyrics? Uh, yes and no. It's not conscious uh, on my part. Um, prose for me is more... Uh, I guess I'm, I'm more inspired by somebody like Lord Dunsany uh, than, mm. I, than I am my music. Um, and in fact, I've tried to incorporate Dunsany's prose style into some of our lyrics. Um, so I think that, you know, my writing is probably more influenced by other people's writing than music. But my music okay. is influenced by those people's writing. If that makes sense, it's it's not something I think out. It's just uh, like with, like with music though. Whatever bands I grew up, I liked. I don't hide it in our music. If if I want to make a nod towards someone um, musically, like Black Sabbath, you'll hear stuff that's going to remind you of that and Rush and Yes mm -hmm. and all these other bands. I like. Um, I, I'm not going to hide it in my writing of, of novels either. It's uh, I, I thought the idea of combining something like some some of the heavy adjectives of Lovecraft with some of the prose of of uh, Dunsany and uh, the you know swords flashing and you know so I, I do catch it and I've had people tell me oh we can tell you're a songwriter when we read your your uh, your stuff and I don't know how that works but uh, I guess it's in there. Yeah. Yeah, it's curious, isn't it? You can't really seem to, I mean, we all have our influences and I don't think anyone should ever try to really hide them. I mean, it's foolish because they'll be in there anyway, right? They've, they've imprinted on you. Mm -hmm. um, but to, to people saying, no, I can tell you're a songwriter um, and, and you're wondering, oh, really? Uh, I sympathize because uh, I'm originally trained more as a screenwriter and in my prose, people will say, oh, I can tell you're a screenwriter. You know, it's kind of clipped, very image, you know, driven. And then people read my screenplays and they're like, oh, I can tell you're a prose writer. I'm like, which, how? <laughs> yeah. Well, they can see it more than we can. Yeah. yeah. I suppose that's true. But, oh, man. <laughs> uh, I, I got to say, one of the reasons I was really excited to have you on, Steve, is because, you know, I've been studying the genre pretty intently the last five years or so. And, you know, getting to talk to interesting people like yourself, only further enriching my knowledge. But, man. I don't know if you've noticed, you know, a listener, uh, Steve and I both met through the Whetstone Tavern Discord I mentioned here so frequently. And there's one channel on that Discord I just never, ever poke my head into is the music one, because uh, my taste just lay elsewhere, but also, you know, for the, to the genres that tend to dominate. Uh, but also, if there's one aspect of sword and sorcery, which I'm just woefully ignorant of, it is the role of music in its fandom and why certain genres, you know, metal, prog rock, are particularly popular. Would you mind, uh, just you know, from your lived experience, uh, educating uh, me and us, those listening uh, on the subject and how Glasshammer fits into that? You know, I think sword and sorcery—it's—it's it's a hard. It, I mean, we all know exactly what it is, but it's—it's 
it's hard to condense into a few words, but it's dramatic. Uh, and the style of music that certain people are drawn to write, uh, they're kind of given to that. I mean, it's got a drama to it, I think. So it's easy. I would say that scholars of progressive rock might tell you that it was born out of uh, you know late sixties drugs and psychedelia. You know, I, I'm not qualified to speak on that because I was a child when that <laughs> the, the prog rock genre sort of came to be. But I believe a lot of people in the sixties were just heavy into Tolkien, and uh, I'm old enough to remember you know the airbrushed vans. Uh, you know, of wizards shooting bolts, you know, out of, you know. Uh, so there's just a lot of that in that era as that music developed. And all those rock stars of the late 60s and 70s, uh, in progressive rock especially, I'd say, were into uh, Lord of the Rings, and, uh, Moorcock, you know. Uh, there was the band Hawkwind that uh, probably, probably still Right, I know a little bit about area. that, but do you mind yeah. expanding upon uh, Moorcock and his, uh, you know, the, the influence in music and his role? Because, like, he wrote lyrics for some bands or yeah, something? He, I, again, I'm, this he, is my blank spot. He definitely did for a um, for the band Hawkwind. I don't know who else he was involved with. Uh, but so that was my first indication, I guess, in that I probably didn't discover them until the 80s, that, that there was a writer of fantasy who I read that was associated with a, a pretty cool, trippy kind of metal. Spa they're called, it's called space rock is what they do. And I think he came out on stage with them and read some poetry and, and then he did write some lyrics. And so I even tried to incorporate that with the, we have a, a writer. He just passed away a couple of years. I don't know if you're familiar with him named Robert Lowe, uh, okay. who wrote the Oath Sworn trilogy. So he was great with Viking uh, fiction. It's sort of sword and sorcery. And anyway, he ended up being a fan of Glass Hammer, and so he wrote some poetry, and we put it to music, and you know, tried to keep that kind of uh, uh, interesting marriage of literature and music uh, going hand in hand. But you know, I don't, I don't know that much about how it happened. I, I just, I just know that musicians at that time were really into fantasy, and the album covers, you know, really showed that off too. Um, the uh, was a famous iconic artist named Roger Dean who did all the Yes covers and got to do. We got to work with him on a Glass Hammer album cover, a super guy. But he sort of had these fantastic landscapes and just you know really trippy kind of stuff. Not psychedelic. I guess as the seventies drew on, it became more fantasy uh, album cover art. So something was going on there. Well, certainly everybody was looking at Frazetta and going, that's interesting. I, I, can't, I can't help but imagine he influenced some of this album art. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I don't. he didn't do the, the Molly Hatchet covers. That was, uh, I can't remember who did that. Uh, but it, it, was, it had a Frazetta look to it. Um, yeah, and I was one of those kids that had that Frazetta book. I had Roger Dean's book and I had Frazetta's. And just used to just stare at that stuff. You know, Before I read Conan, I'm sure uh, I was into mm -hmm. Frazetta. Cool. And so where do you feel the glass hammer fits into this kind of tradition? Well, we have, they, they credited us in the early 90s, some French magazine, uh, with the rebirth of the concept album. And that was, we were probably one of the first after several years to kind of revive that. And, and again, it just all comes back to a desire to tell stories. And the best way to do that at that time in my life was through music. So we've become well known in our circles for concept albums. You know, I feel like I was going to ask this further in the interview, but I think now is a good time. We were kind of adjacent to the uh, art side of things. You know, um, I really dig the cover art on you know Scalagram, the book, Thank you. Uh, and I deeply appreciated that there is some interior illustration as well, including a classic fantasy map right near the start. Okay. How um, similar would you say are the things you want from the cover of your novel as opposed to the cover of your albums? I mean, is it more or less the same or do you feel there's something else you want to go for? Uh, yeah, there's something else I want to go for when I discovered that particular artist and um, for the book. You know, and you never know when you're looking at an image online, you know, uh, what it's going to look like in print, you know, because it's all backlit and it's beautiful, you know, and then suddenly it's like, wait a minute, that's, I'm looking at it right now. It's like a little too dark. 
I don't know that it tra- and I'm into uh, you know marketing music and marketing book, this book too. So I have to think, well, what's going to stand out? Because you get about you know a tiny little square of space or rectangle to to sell that idea. People judge books by their covers. It's just yeah, the thumbnail really has influenced cover art, hasn't it? Christ. And I'm not sure mine works so well as a thumbnail as it does when you actually see the thing. Uh, and and again, when it's especially when it's back on the screen, it's just got this weirdness to it. It's got that uh, sort of new cliche thing where you've got a swordsman facing the opposite direction because they don't want you to see his face. That's a big thing. Uh, and I just don't like those, uh, you know, all those. They look like pre-generated covers where it's yeah. always some girl with a bow or somebody, with, but they're not looking at you. You know, they're they're looking off at whatever's going to kill them. Um, but with this, it's just a strange enough sort of smeary sort of art that I think it gives you a lot more room to try to fill in the gaps for yourself. Um, and that to me was important for this. I, I hope that I'll be able to stick with this artist for the rest of these books. Right. I'm looking on the inside here. Uh, they go by the name, uh, waking of sky tree. I never got the name out of the guy. <laughs> I never got his name. I'm like, I gotta give you a credit, and that's that's his credit. It's strange. Okay. I don't Waking know. of Sky Tree. So if people want to check him out, they can Google that. Okay. Yeah, he's a good. He's got a lot of good stuff online, uh, and it's all very similar. And he was very kind about, uh, uh, you know, very quickly, like uh, working with the sword on the cover. Uh, it was a little short, it was a little off, and I'm like, could you adjust this? Could you make it longer, more intimidating? And, I don't know, an hour later, he sends the cover, you know, so he's fast, and I like that. Well, that's a value for sure yeah. in collaboration. Yeah. But we've got an artist that I've worked with for 10 years or more now uh, with Glass Hammer uh, named Michael Zay Larank, and he's an excellent uh, illustrator. He's not an illustrator. He's just, just a, a great design artist. Uh, but and he's done my Scalagram albums a little more literal uh, than I would have wanted the book. So uh, he's he's still helping me out with it. But yeah, I just this artist. And cool. If, and if you'll stick with me, I'll stick with it. You know, if it's a trilogy or a quartet of books, it needs to look alike. So you know, we'll see. <laughs> Okay, yeah, and I see, I do dig what you're saying about your cover, because yeah, it's true, you do have kind of an over-the-shoulder person looking, you know, holding a sword or whatever, but uh, yeah, I agree, having that sort of, um, you need room to engage the imagination of the viewer, right? I mean, I think about what you were saying a moment ago about those books of art you stared at as a you know young man, and I mean, what are you doing, right? It's not that it takes you that long to register what's on the page, it's that you're imagining, you're thinking, oh man, what's the story behind this image? Where does it come from? Where is it going? And I think the sort of sort of a bit of smeariness, bit of darkness, sort of a, you know, hazy view of the city ahead as opposed to a perfectly crisp, you know, computer colored photorealistic thing. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's part of what grabbed me, frankly. I good, was kind of like, good. oh, I'm okay, glad I you like see what's it. going on here. I haven't heard a lot of comments about it yet, uh, but uh, I'm glad you like it. My son uh, is 20 and he's very uh, critical, of, you know, at this age of what I do or don't do. And very, very helpful, actually, because I'm trying to, trying to be relevant, you know, <laughs> and uh, he was like, oh, I like that. That doesn't look like anything else. Good, because I hope it doesn't read like anything else either. So, I mean, I'm sure it does. Well, there you go. Yeah. And then you've got, as I say, the fantasy map on the inside, right. which I uh, rather enjoyed. Good. Uh, classic uh, touch. And then uh, a nice big black and white illustration on the interior, which most novels aren't doing anymore. I liked uh, the, I just had reread uh, the Elric books, my favorite version of them, I guess. And, it seems like I got one through Amazon. I lost my old copies and it had oh. illustrations in it. And that was sort of the inspiration. Like, Hey, let's stick one of those in there. Now this, the guy that did that illustration, he did illustrations for our albums. Oh, cool. Okay. Uh, for the, the Scalagram albums, which I think is pretty neat. Uh, that was part of the idea originally was let's make this look like some old sword and sorcery project. And I commissioned an, an ink artist to do sketches, you know, sword fight, the sword fighters, and uh, just another phenomenal guy. Uh, I think I can't pronounce his last name, but it's Luke Eidenschink, I think is his name. Just a phenomenal ink artist. 
and works really fast and really excited. He's got a cool Instagram account. And I think that's where I discovered. So he's done, I don't know, I think something in maybe 16 or 17 illustrations for the albums so far. Wow. Yeah. That's really cool, man, because like, you know, I think if there's one thing I definitely missed from when I was a kid, sort of in the uh, you know 80s through 90s, um, it's, it's finding those interior illustrations because like, yeah, I've got a functional imagination, but it's fun to see an interpretation and kind of compare, you know, oh, okay, there's how I imagine the character. Here's how they've done, rendered them. You know, how do I think about that? And then you start to identify a certain artist style with a series and, you know, yeah, yeah I, I just... I, I imagine it's mostly cost cutting that has reduced that as a trend in uh, most books these days. I don't think it's because people got fed up with cool art. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Well, and you notice know, too that in, I did the trick in the back where, uh, in that back illustration where my character's facing the opposite direction. Uh, <laughs> but he, uh, Luke, drew several uh, illustrations, of, I mean, where Scalagram is face on. Uh, and it was so early when he developed how he looked, uh, that I didn't ever think that it looked like I wanted him to look. And um, so I don't want to mm -hmm. put that in picture in any reader's minds, um, right. until I can get that developed, you know, you sort mm -hmm. of picture your character a certain way. Um, but I don't want everybody you didn't to have, have like to a celebrity in mind or something. <laughs> oh, well, sure. In my case, it was, uh, it was something like, you know, Jon Snow, with a with a oh, okay. with a bad scar on his face, I think that's kind of how I pictured it. But I don't want anybody else to be constrained to that. And I did. Speaking of that scar, I really uh, felt the book grab me right from the start because uh, uh, you're not being nice to your character there. <laughs> no. In chapters uh, one through you know five or so, there, but especially right at the damn start, I was like, oh, he's getting messed up. Uh, is he the main? Yeah, no, it's the main character. It's his name. <laughs> yeah, uh, and I wanted the scar to kind of represent. And, and get it out right in the open that he is a scarred man. I mean, he's a flawed, he's a flawed man. He's not, uh, I like to refer back to Eric Bright Eyes. I like that character a lot from the Haggard book. Uh, he's not particularly noble. He, you know, he might work out that he is, but uh, he's just a flawed guy. And I want him to carry some kind of scar through his life that he can't, Huh. He can't shake like we all do. Sorry, for those who aren't familiar, do you mind just briefly saying who Eric Bright Eyes is? What's he from? Eric Bright Eyes, uh, it's, what is it, H.R.R. Haggard? Is that the writer's name? Okay, I think it's three R or two R's in the H.R.R. Haggard, uh, who wrote the uh, Alan Quartermain books. Uh, uh, was it Solomon's Minds? I think that was the name. Um, <laughs> and some point, I was... I don't know, 15 years or so ago, I was getting into William Morris, I'm trying to look back uh, at what Tolkien and Lewis's influences were, so to speak, and Haggard's name came up. And I'm like, oh, I used to watch those movies when I was a kid, you know, these African safari kind of things that he did. And Eric Bright Eyes came up as a kind of a Nordic story, and it's just written beautifully. So I, I'd highly recommend it. In fact, the, the name Scalagram popped right out of that book. He's, uh, have you read it? Have you read Eric Bright Eyes? Myself? No, not yet. Yeah, uh, it's phenomenal. I, I think Brian Murphy refers to it in his uh, book on sword and sorcery. But it's just a phenomenal story uh, written beautifully. And the character Scalagram in that book is a berserker. Uh -huh. He's an alcoholic <laughs> berserker. And I think years ago, I even thought, hey, it'd be neat to take that guy's story and write it out and see what happens with it. Anyway, and it ditched that idea and just took the name. But uh, yeah, that's, it's, I think everybody in the, to our genre should definitely pick that up and read it. Very cool. Yeah, no, I, I, I love going back and, you know, to your own influences and then going, yeah, who influenced them and just right. following the chain because you never know what you're going to learn, what you're going to pick up. Yeah. You know, I uh, can, of course, be one of the many people who can thank uh, Howard Andrew Jones for drawing attention to the author Howard Lamb, yeah. oh, who I've was a major that, yeah. influence yeah. on Robert E. Howard Conan. So many Howards. Yeah. <laughs> the chain of Howards is a, is a fine chain to yeah. uh, follow if you want to learn a bit about pacing, for example. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, she, uh, this is the book, huh? So, uh, so, <laughs> so Scalagrim in the Vale of Picarna, how would you describe it to someone who knows nothing about the book or its story? What's the kind of the wee pitch? Well, they do this with albums 
when they try to review, they're always going to, it's, it's hard to not compare it to someone else. Uh, and in my case, it's best described. I think if I at least say what writers influenced it, uh, I wanted it to have to build towards a story that could fall under the umbrella of cosmic horror. I don't think the first book is the, the story as it grows will become that, um, my own twist on cosmic horror. I'm not as hopeless as, <laughs> as most of those writers are. Um, but, uh, so there's a lot of Lovecraft in it. I, I overuse adjectives and a couple of critics have definitely picked up on that. It was described as Baroque, but by some, I'm like, I had to look that up. I'm like, now I know what Baroque means, but let's, oh, heavily ornamented. Yeah, I get it. So, uh, and I'm, you know, it was my first book. I think I've made a few mistakes in it, but uh, as far as my choices, how things went, you know, boy, I'm making a long answer out of this. So, uh, it's all right. Hey, I, I thought it was really well crafted, thank period. You, Never you. mind for a first novel. Thank you. Um, uh, but certainly for a first novel. But yeah, I'd say anyone that's, that likes sword and sorcery that uh, would also enjoy a little bit of Lovecraftian uh, horror mixed in, some. Uh, some of the hopelessness of the writings like of Clark Ashton Smith, um, they would like it. He's a, he's a flawed character. He's not a muscle guy. He's not Conan. Um, he's not, certainly not Elric. He's not a sorcerer and he's not an elf uh, of some sort. Uh, he's just a, a young guy that's really lonely. That's found himself in a terrible situation. Uh, and it's very unfair. His memory has been stolen. Um, he he sees a girl. So this is somebody referred to this as a chase the princess story, and I mm -hmm. guess in a way it is. Um, but he sees a girl. He knows he loves her, but he can't remember really anything about it, why. And she's being kidnapped in front of his eyes while people are trying to kill him. So the the novel starts off with a bang, and it's all bad and nothing's good. And the further this poor guy goes uh, along his trip to try to find her and find out what's happened to himself, the worse things get. And that, I think, is something anybody at least of a certain age can relate to. So I, I wanted him to be a very relatable character. He's full of self-doubt. It gnaws at him continually. Uh, he gets through one situation, and, and here comes another uh, and he has no idea what's coming at him next and no idea what's happened and no idea if he's if he's not just made all of it up in his head so he's a very um torn and conflicted character out of his own but he does get help mm -hmm. uh, from on high and that was important to me was the the strength or the hope mm -hmm. that uh, uh he would need to get through this it didn't come from inside him at all it, caught, it came because he, he cried out to help, for help uh, and didn't even know who he was talking to. Uh, and suddenly, here comes the magic sword. So all of these things, even though they're sword and sorcery, they represent to me, there's, there's a subtext, in other words. Um, the sword, to me, represents hope. Um, huh. Scalagrim is just any of us uh, that's, that's trying to get through life. Um, the girl in this case that he's hunting she represents um, joy that has been lost and if you've experienced that before uh, in any sort of a tragedy it's devastating and uh, you just sort of lose your way and uh, so I, I wanted to make a character that could go through, through some of these things and let's see how he works through it and comes out the other end the subtext to me, though, I don't want to overwhelm the story, um, and it's not allegory, uh, but I do think it's important. In my case, I didn't want to write Pulp Fiction, in other words. I wanted there to be right. something something bigger uh, behind the, the, the basic story, and people can pick up on that or not, however they enjoy reading. So they can look for it. It's there. Yeah, well, I mean, I, you know, people, there's one thing I, that I've been reminded of quite a bit recently is that you have no control over what people will take from your art. You can only put stuff there yeah. and they'll pick up what they pick yeah. up. But if it's not there, they can't pick it up, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's the way we did things with, 
our albums. You know, I have a worldview that I present through our albums, but it's it's not there to. I'm not trying to beat anybody in the head with it. It's just there. If you pick up on it, great. It'll add to your enjoyment of it. And if not, I hope that it stands alone without all that. So hmm. my mission, I think, even in music is 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 to create something people will enjoy, not to get a point across. That's for me. But, uh, it's still there. <laughs> or even enjoy while hearing that point. Yeah. You know? I, I think there's nothing wrong. I feel like I've been saying this a lot on the podcast lately, so I'm not going to repeat myself or go on at length, but I, I feel like there's always your story is always going to say something. You may as well be intentional about it yep. because then you control more so what it says. Yeah. You know, the attempt to avoid, you know, people who get embarrassed when they say, oh, I don't have themes, I don't have messages in my story. It's like, well, yeah, I mean, you do in a way because they're always influenced by who you are as a person, your collection of, you know, experiences, beliefs, choice, you know, and all the choices you make in the tale. So you may as well be intentional. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess, that too, that probably in my case, it came for me ahead of the plot. You know, I found myself developing the plot as I went. I, I would never do that again. <laughs> you have to, you have to, uh, and I was just learning also, you know, what, what is writing a novel? What's the, so it sounds like you weren't a big outliner then. It was more of a no, pantsing, was, as some people was, like to call it. Pan, it was pantsing, yeah. A lot of the characters just showed up on the page. Uh, one or two of them came from previous album, concept albums I did. Hmm. Um, but yeah, a lot of the, a lot of what's happened, the big stuff that happened happened only because I started writing it. And, uh, you know, it, originally it was just a guy looking for a girl fighting sorcerers. You know, and it, <laughs> it became as Tolkien said, it grew in the telling. You know, it just became, and I like to let it go that way. To me, that's part of the fun is discovering these things. Like you know, you don't come up with them, you don't know where they come from. They're just there in front of you and it just takes on a whole life of its own it's fantastic it's fun if nothing else to let that happen well i admire uh, you and people like you who can do that i oh man well i guess if you've heard any of my outlining episodes on the podcast like i gotta figure it all out <laughs> i gotta figure out so much i do leave room i mean you have to otherwise you're literally just writing the story but yeah i i uh i get wary of not having a blueprint and then i watch other people just it's like watching it's like i'm sitting on the beach building the most archaic, you know, sands yeah. castle. And then uh, we have a protractor ruler. And some of the guys just surfing <laughs> on the water. I'm like, I want to, how do you do, how do you do that? <laughs> there's a, there's a famous scene uh, from, uh, it's an, the old, old, old movie Waterloo. And I think this is a real incident where Wellington is sit, sitting on the battlefield before the battle, reading in the paper, leaned up against a tree. And his, uh, one of his, uh, you know, generals that served under him have come up and they're like, and he's not told him anything. And they're like, well, what's the plan? You know, and he just looks up from his paper and says, well, to win. <laughs> uh, and I know that he had more of a plan than that, but my idea is you have a basic plan, uh, but then anything can happen, like in a battle. And you've got to be ready to move when it does, you know, and alter your plan. It's the same thing. You, you can write an outline, and I've done that, like on this second book I'm working on. And I know when I write it, it's going to get thrown out. I think there's 10 of them. Now. I'm using it more or less to try to keep myself in line uh, so that a 100,000 word novel doesn't become 250,000 words. So I'm trying to map out what needs to happen and what needs to happen mm -hmm. where. But if something interesting happens along the way, I'm going to die with it. Yeah. Yeah. We'll just Fair start enough. a different book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a, that's a great flexibility to have. Um, something I was wondering, actually, while I was reading, I thought, you know, I love to make playlists for projects. I find that they, you know, if I, if I switch between one story and another one, uh, if I can switch to, to a playlist, I identify with that story. It gets my head in the game quicker. Uh, but then I thought, well, hang on, it's a little different with this book. Right? Like, what music did you listen to while writing it? And was it Glass Hammer, or would it be hearing your own stuff be too distracting? Like, yeah, uh, you know. Yeah, it would be. Um, and I've separated the two. I mean, I really have. Once I started writing the book, I'm like, this character's not the same as that one on the album. Uh, you know, if you read, if you read that, I think I sent you the PDFs and all that. If, if you read the story in the albums, you know, he's a very, it comes across a little more like Conan. I did this, I did that, you know, um, 
and this character in the book is just a like I said, he's just a beat up, miserable guy, and uh, having the worst time of his life. And uh, so it's very different. And I just so I didn't listen to the music except we were writing it while I was <laughs> while I was writing it. Uh, so. But, I, you know, what I would do is I would put these headphones on while I type sometimes and just put on this these atmospheres, like an ambiance, like a dungeon. You know, you hear dripping water and just creepy things and wind blowing. And I just kind of let myself go with that uh, just to kind of close myself off from everything. So not music, for sure. It was right. more, more about, you know, soundscapes. Yeah, no, that makes sense because I, I I am comfortable listening to music with lyrics when I'm writing, but again, it's not you know my music, yeah. <laughs> and I want I just kind of maybe think you know I was like uh, I, I can't listen to a podcast while I write a story because that's almost like trying to do math while someone yeah, shouts oh, random yeah. numbers in your ear, yeah. and I guess yeah maybe to a degree for some people that's the same feeling with music with lyrics and you just want some nice clean atmospheric stuff as you say yeah. uh, to help get you in the zone. Yeah. And sometimes it's just sitting in, and particularly sitting in this room I'm in right now, and just kind of get off to myself and not listen to anything, and uh, and just write. And there's a million distractions, you know, but that's that comes with the territory. <laughs> um, so I think you, yeah, you mentioned. Um, pardon me, I think I know you mentioned the original inspiration, uh, sort of for Scalagram. How long was the road from your first notion of "Hey, I'm going to do this" to holding a finished copy of the book in your hand? I guess so. What the lock? The lockdown was 2019, 2020. It's lost. Uh, well, I mean, in, in Canada, certainly, uh, we didn't really even know what was going on until mid March, twenty twenty. Yes, yeah, so twenty twenty, and I think in June or May, April, some. Uh, I, I guess they shut all our businesses down here, and so it was started then, and then just came out last March. Uh, this past March, so from 2020 to 2022. Uh, but a lot of that, I guess it was written and completed in about seven months. And then the rest of the time was just trying to figure out, you know, how to put that book out. Uh, I didn't waste too much time looking for a publisher. Uh, I've never been one to sit around and wait. And um, mm -hmm. so I had to figure out how to print it. It's the, the, the whole Amazon KDP thing was... Uh, for indie publishers was a little more involved than I remember it to be in 2015. So, I, you know, it's just a lot of, a lot of time researching what I was about to do after I wrote it and then editing and editing and editing and editing. Yeah. I was going to say, how was the editing? Did you have beta reader buddies? I, uh, did you work with a professional editor? I only went with one beta reader and he was a glass hammer fan. So I, I knew that it was going to be tricky because he was probably going to like everything. And, uh, but he had, reams of, of stuff he sent me it had it had meant so much to him and I'm, oh my gosh you know this might be good this might not be bad and so that helped uh and i sent it to him in stages before i was done and then sent him the whole thing and he was ecstatic it made him cry and if i can make somebody cry then that's a win i guess um, mm. but then i went with an editor uh and then i had to edit the editor and, uh, and then I saw some neat reviews where there's no typos in this. There's no typos. It's unbelievable. Most books have typos. There's no typos. And then somebody wrote me, uh, it was about a month ago. Like, here's a list of the typos I found. I'm like, thanks. <laughs> thanks. I'd rather just not have known at this point. So I got five or six of those. It's just endless. I guess I read it 18 times uh, after I was done and marked it up in my Kindle. And then we'd mm -hmm. go sit down and try to rework it without screwing up the format. You know, it was, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was grueling. But I thought if I don't hate this after reading it so many times, then then okay, it must be okay. Well, yeah, isn't that the test? You know, you're talking about the typos and still finding the bloody things. You know, well after uh, you think it's finished. I uh, have been, you know, doing kind of an audiobook thing bonus for my Patreon where I read through my first couple of novels and talk about each chapter as I go along. Mm -hmm. The second book in particular, like I had a professional editor to go through that. I went through that many times and I have been finding typos as I read it <laughs> into the record. And it's, oh my God, on the one hand, great, I can fix them because it's self-pub. Uh, you know, it's easy to yeah, go in there and do that. It, yeah. But uh, 
But oh my God, I would have thought by now, you know? But then as you say, there's the other experience that's very pleasing when you read your book for the upteenth time of like, there is the parts in the book that I really want to, I mean, you want the whole thing to impact people, but there's the moments you really want to hit the reader. And if you read those moments and you feel kind of that, yeah, feeling that you had when you were first writing it still. Yeah. It's that a, can't be bad, can it? A sense of wonder is what I would describe that as. If you, you can bring your character to a place and, and, you read it and you feel what you wanted to make other people feel and you can kind of be sort of objective and, and stand back as if you're reading a story you didn't write that it works on you uh, and i think that's that's what we all got to do whatever it is music art anything you just write for yourself and if you make yourself happy then there's probably a few thousand people at least in a planet with several billion people that are going to be okay with that and like what you did you just have to find them you know yeah, exactly and i don't think we we're reinventing the wheel here with scalagram it's you know that type of book has been done plenty uh it's just maybe there's something i have to offer that kind of a story that somebody else wouldn't have thought of you know well yeah i mean it's your execution right. and it's uh, got your uh, sort of music in there i mean there's literally songs in the yeah. in, in the book yeah. you know which i mean has been done in human history but i have not seen a lot of well that was uh, a definitely uh, that was a tolkien thing for me it was that so many poems yeah. and when i first read it i just loved the, the songs and early on i had the song book you know that went with tolkien's stuff and so i determined if i ever did this it was going to have uh, either glass hammer lyrics in it or yeah. brand new lyrics and it was just something I enjoyed as a as a reader you know, growing up. It just added something uh, to it. You know, the, the instructions usually are if it doesn't develop the plot, advance the plot, then leave it out. Who cares? You know, <laughs> sing sing a song. People sing. You know, yeah. so sing a song. And this <laughs> the character Scaligram, literally uh, at one of the most horrible moments, I guess, or he's about to go through one of the worst, just breaks into a song uh, on top of a hilltop. And I'm like, you know, is this sound of music or, or what's going on? <laughs> Picture him lifting his voice on high, you know. But what a neat setting for that kind of singing, you know, to even if it is a bit like sound of music, like whatever. First of all, insanely popular story. Yeah. But also, <laughs> I mean, part of the fun is, is, is I think, I'm creating is... is well, it's, it's almost like remixing. Like, I, I don't think anybody reading this book would, I mean, like maybe after they listen to this interview, but, you know, if they just came in cold, would be expecting uh, the music to come in. And that makes you kind of go, what? And, you know, snap back and yeah. then refocus yeah. and then go, okay, I got to read this bit a little differently. Yeah. You know, it, it really draws your attention to what you're reading. It's, I think, uh, if nothing else, has value for that. Well, uh, yeah. Aside from also being very, and being so, yeah, since our lyrics were often stories too, I put one in. Uh, that's the, there's the character Swan Hill and she she kind of sings a song at some point in the book that I had written and there's characters mentioned in the song and that's given me sort of a, a way to do some different characters in the new book and introduce those characters so they're introduced through lyrics and then they sort of jump out of those lyrics and come alive so it's you know it serves many purposes but mainly it's just I like to see italicized yeah. <laughs> verses smack in the middle of a chapter every now and then and then with that white space as well. So again, it describes you, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, as we're getting near the end here, I, I wonder, um, was Scalagrim always going to be a series? Or did that sort of, was that something you discovered uh, as you were working on it? No, I think I knew it would take more books to tell the story. And I do know how it ends. Um, so no, it was always going to be at the very least a trilogy, if not a quartet. And mm -hmm. I've also got a uh, the possibility of doing short stories later with the character so i'm leaving some big time gaps that can yeah. be filled in later because to me i think that'd be fun too is once people know the character let's go back and just do some some more short stories and tr like traditional sword and sorcery stories um, things that yeah well i mean that's certainly a tradition right i mean warcock's doing it right now yes, he's got he is, uh, yeah. you know a book just coming out with the sort of elric from yeah since sort of kind of the first quarter of elric's original adventures he's found a gap and wedged a whole new novel in there yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yeah you find the gap so i built the gap in ahead of time so, yeah <laughs> Very cool. Is there anything you can sort of tease us with without giving it too, you know, too much away as to what's coming up next for uh, Scalagrim in the books to come? In the books to come, he uh, he's going to war um, at the end. I'm not, I can't really spoil the end of book one, but oh, no, I will say that you know what 
he has many more trials ahead of him and he does evolve as a character. He's, he's definitely got an arc. Um, he may get a little ahead of himself in the next book and finally gain some confidence that doesn't particularly work out for him. Uh, <laughs> And I, I guess my, my big thing is to just amp up the horror mm-hmm. element uh, the further we go and leave people hanging every time. I, but I do promise I know how it ends, uh, and it won't end like anybody thinks it's going to. So it's, it's going to be fun. <laughs> it's going to be fun. Awesome. So, all right, let's, let's, let's wrap it up here. Where, where should people look for you online if they are interested in your novel and, uh, of course, musical endeavors? Uh, musical endeavors is glasshammer.com. And uh, if you're into progressive rock, you may have heard of us. Uh, if not, please give us a try. Uh, all kinds of music. We have heavy, heavy to hard kind of metal prog and uh, to really beautiful symphonic stuff. Uh, and then the books, uh, I'm on Stephen R. Babb. That's S-T-E-P-H-E-N, middle initial R, Babb, B-A-B-B, dot com. And, uh, and, of course, it's on Amazon and Cool. Pretty much anywhere else for for Kindle, for ebooks, whatever. But there's print books available. Okay, awesome. I'll put those links in the show notes, listeners, so easy peasy to find and click on. Go through, buy that book, buy that album, do it all. Yes, uh, please, please, please. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> and there's a new album coming, right? Yes, uh, it's called At the Gate, and it will wrap up the album versions of Scaligram's life. Uh, but again, I've I've decided we're going to keep that bit a little separate from the books it's not going to end the same way the books will so there's no spoilers built into the albums but yeah we've done three scalagram albums we're working on it today that third album at the gate due out uh, october yeah october 7th uh this year so we're about done awesome and uh, i uh, enjoyed listening to the two albums you sent me thank you so much I, you know i'm I must admit, I was listening to it. And I thought, you know, maybe I'm more into prog rock than I realized, or maybe it's just really good. Uh, <laughs> and so I, you know, I don't think I mentioned this uh, before, but I, I'm threading in some of your tunes uh, to the episode uh, today instead of our usual theme music. And I thought we might go out on uh, the Forlorn Hope. Okay, I particularly oh, enjoyed that track. Yeah. And just out of curiosity, is there any um, story behind that song or anything fun you want to tell us about it? Oh, gosh, no. The whole album uh, was fun. We had just introduced a brand new uh, singer. Um, uh, Hannah Pryor so we were having a blast working with her and the forlorn hope is a phrase uh, uh, actually taken from uh, some of my historical fiction uh, readings which is a uh, it's that group of people that run through the breach uh, ahead of everybody else in a big uh, siege uh, and they're called the forlorn hope because they're not expected to live so that's that's, that's how that works out yeah Ah, cheers. All right. Well, this was really wonderful, Steve. Oh, thank, thank you so, you so much for thank coming you on. Thank you so much. Yeah, and uh, for lending us uh, your music for the show. I think it's going to be really fun. Oh, great. Thank you. All right. Take care. All right. So I'm writing a novel. It features original intro, transition, and outro music by Glasshammer, and is hosted by yours truly, Oliver Brackenbury. If you'd like to submit a question, then please email it to so I'm writing a novel at gmail.com. You can also holler at the show on Twitter. Look for at so underscore writing. That's at so writing. Please consider sharing the show with anybody who might like it, or checking out any of the other ways you can support the show by heading to so I'm writing a novel.com slash support the show, which has things like links to our Patreon, Coffee, and PayPal. Thanks for hanging out with me and Steve Babb, and I'll see you next time. For now, Here's a little track by Glasshammer I may have mentioned at the end of the interview.